Hi, I'm Amber, and welcome to the Lone Star Keto Podcast. Today, we have a special guest with us, Mandy Podlesny. She is a keto coach, and she's had her fair share of dealing with chronic illness. Welcome, Mandy. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So we're going to talk a lot about what it's like uh, having chronic illness and uh, just a little bit of everything in, in the health wise of dealing with keto and, you know, how to go about doing it and, you know, good advice like that. So let's start with you uh, telling us a little bit about your background. Yeah. So I, you told me Five years ago, I'd be on a podcast talking about keto. I'd be like, what the hell is keto one and two? Um, weird. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so that's what I do. I'm a empowered eating coach. I really use ketogenic principles, lifestyle, or and low-carb principles. Um, that's what I do now. But the reason why I do what I do is because I've been challenged since I was 19 with um, autoimmune inflammatory issues. And I was misdiagnosed for probably over a decade and I was playing with um, natural supplements. I was playing with detoxes. I was doing my own research on my own nutrition, doing paleo and then burritos and tequila and avoiding and you know all of these things that we do. Um, and yeah, it started when I was 19. I was misdiagnosed with um, for so long. And I was supposed to just have a regular old meniscal tear at 19. And I went in for surgery and they were supposed to fix it and it never healed. Spent about a good six months bouncing between a rheumatologist who deals with just inflammation and then a auto orthopedic. Um, they were blaming each other, went in for a second exploratory surgery and my whole entire body swelled up. So uh, we knew that there was some sort of autoimmune. My body just wasn't handling things. And mind you, I'm at 19 trying to like live my best life, like with college and making it my own own life. And it was just a lot. Um, and I went to probably every doctor on the East coast, um, specialists. And I've been told I have lupus to Lyme disease to who knows, like I've literally been thrown all of the diagnoses and everything. And it was just after i got frustrated with every single doctor that I went to, um, and being pumped with drugs and all of this, I just was like, I'm just going to take Advil and do a diet, I guess. And that didn't really work <laughs> out the way, um, we think that it is, or as simple as it is. And I just avoided for a really long time. And then I got to a point with, um, my dad, he looked at me, um, when I went to go visit him and he said, you look like crap explain the other word. I don't know if I could swear on this podcast, but, um, yeah, you look terrible and explicitive. My dad's amazing. Don't get me wrong, but it was actually the thing that I needed to hear, um, uh, because he wasn't wrong. I was, my knees were so deformed. I knew I needed to have some sort of surgery to fix that. I was walking on my toes. My arms were popped up. My elbow was frozen. So I walked like a baby dinosaur and I just made fun of myself, um, for so long. And I had five surgeries in two years. Um, joint knee replacement surgery, elbow surgery, ankle surgery, uh, mm. knee revision, my left one revised again. So it was a lot, but because my dad said, you look like crap, it actually took, empowered me to, despite the directness, um, to take health into my own hands and really just focus on what works best for me, not what I'm supposed to be doing or what the blog say, or this anti anti-inflammatory diet. So I got diagnosed ankylosing spondylitis. Um, and then that actually set me up to have the surgeries recovered from all of the surgeries. And while I was recovering, I was still chronically fatigued. Um, I wasn't able to walk one foot in front of the other down the stairs, um, could barely keep my eyes open for longer than two hours. Um, living in New York city, recovering from all of my surgeries as mm. well. And I found the power of ketosis. Uh, <laughs> so that's kind of just how I started my whole journey. Um, but yeah, I started found the power of ketosis through drinking actually pure therapeutic ketones. Um, but I knew that that wasn't really a full solution. That's a bandaid. They're amazing. I love them, et cetera. Keto Cameron's calm down. They are really amazing. Um, but, uh, you know, that's just one tool to put in your toolbox. You have to really focus on all a whole bunch of other factors as well, but that's my spiel girl. <laughs> 
Well, that's quite a big spiel. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like dealing with this chronic illness. And I hear this a lot that, especially with women, uh, men deal with it too, because I've had some on the podcast who have had some pretty major issues with that. But when they go into the doctor and the doctor, just like you said, throws out, you know, these diagnoses, but there's really not a solution it's up for maybe, you know, oh, let's do surgery on certain things that can, you know, that can work on. What did that make you feel like? Oh man. I like, I, like I teach emotional eating, like I solve emotional eating now, but like, when I tell you that I would go to a doctor's office, basically be berated because I was trying to have the conversation about diet, about my lifestyle, about my gut health, you know, supplements and things like that, that could help. It was immediately shut down. No, you're no, that's not happening. You need to be on X, Y, Z drug, or you're going to be in a wheelchair. Like it was always like that kind of narrative, or I would have doctors be like, well, tequila and cupcakes don't make an impact on your inflammation. So you need to be on these drugs and listen, there are good doctors. Like I will say that I'm not very anti and I'm not anti-medical intervention. Like I'm kind of going down that road personally right now. Um, having to like kind of jump in, I'm not a fully cured person, but when I tell you I was sick in bed at my darkest hour, wanting to drive my car off of La Jolla Shores, um, cliff, that's how bad I was, but I am a completely different person now because of the changes I made, but it's just the way that our life and our society is with medical treatment, but not only just medical treatment, it's diet industry, your food industry, the medical community, they're just, it's trying to treat symptoms and not you as a holistic person. And then diet drama comes with your listening to this right now. And you're just like, Oh, well, I don't understand why I don't have willpower. And why don't I have this? And why don't I have that? It's because of the way the system's designed. And until you realize that you're trapped in, in literally in a system, you have to find the key to get out. And the only way to get out is through yourself. So being empowered enough to fire and hire doctors was something I had to, like, I, I'm at 25 years old. I've probably been fired from jobs instead of like firing doctors, but I've had to have tough conversations at a really young age with adults about my health and wellness, because I couldn't take the support, the lack of support and be like, here to take this drug and this drug, which is not never felt good, you know? Yeah. And I think at this point in time, People need to understand you have to take control in the power mm. of your health. Nobody else is responsible yeah. for that. No matter what they say in the media and all this other rumbo jumbo mm. going on, you yep. and you alone are responsible for your health. Nobody else. And sometimes that means that you need to question. You need to do your own research. You may mm -hmm. have to do that uncomfortable, awful, horrible thing of letting your doctor go and finding one that will work with you, not yes. be, you need a partner. You mm -hmm. don't need somebody dictating. You don't need that. I mean, you know, you need somebody who's going to listen to you. And if that's not your doctor, that's okay. Move on. Find one that does because they are out there. I'm not saying it's just really easy to find one, but they are <laughs> out there and your health is worth it. Yep. Yep. What do you I had think to move. about that? <laughs> um, yes, girl. Slow, stay it louder for the people in the back for sure. Um, no, I mean, I like the doctor that did end up diagnosing me was in San Diego. I was living in San Diego at the time. It was all like divine intervention or something. Cause I was really at the end of my rope when I did see my dad. And, um, like two weeks later, I went into that doctor's office. I got some shot, like steroid shots in my knees. He was like, Holy crap. I think that you have enclosing spondylitis. You have a genetic, I'm all tested with this genetic test that he ran. And I was positive for the genetic test that predisposes me to autoimmune inflammatory stuff. So, um, the doctor was great. He set me up for amazing success, but like, I was so sick and so deformed with my joints that he suggested I actually move back to New York or move back to the East coast and at least go to the hospital for special surgery in New York city, best in the country to have my knees replaced at 27. So it wow. was like, it, it was at his suggestion to go get the best care. Like I didn't want to pack up all my stuff, mm. move out of my amazing place, forgo my whole life that I had in San Diego that I built for seven years to go move and do all of that. But like I had to do what's 
best for me in the overall life. And like, I don't have an extra set of legs I can like just put on, you know? So I know that sounds kind of crazy, but like anytime I'm feeling lack of motivation to like execute, like keep doing, like stay on a diet or, you know, eat like trash or whatever. I always just think, how is this impacting not just now, but also my long term. And then once I'm like, kind of had a couple of days of like veering off track, I'm like, okay, if I don't dial this back and get my inflammation back under control and recalibrate, I'm going to lose my legs. Cause you can only have a certain amount of replacements, you know? And I know it sounds very dramatic, but like, that is the thing that that's my why, like, that's my motivation for myself to have leverage over myself to make good consistent decisions versus all right, I'm going to just do keto for two days and then call it quits, you know? <laughs> okay. So with the thing where there are certain things that genetically you have yep. now you hear the phrase genetic loads, the gun, but diet and lifestyle pull the trigger. Now, yes. my question to you is if you would have had the same knowledge you have now way back when this very first started, do you feel that you could have avoided what happened to you as far as needing the surgeries and stuff? I mean, I know they're obviously they're genetic things, but yeah. you know, what, what do you think? Yeah, I fully agree with you. And it's really easy to fall into, well, I have XYZ disease and this is just my life. Well, I don't care. I'm just going to eat burritos. Right. But like, that's a very victim mentality. I never have looked at myself as a victim. I have had very challenging, um, things in my life, but like you can control what you can control and your circumstances aren't a pass to just continue to eat like yourself, eat like trash or behave poorly or make poor choices. And, um, I just knew once I had this diagnosis, but even without the diagnosis, like I knew I was trying natural things. I always had this hope and belief system that like, I could heal myself. Am I healed still to this day? No. Do I have a lot of work on my mindset and hiring another avid, like going down that rabbit hole again? Yeah, for sure. And I'm not saying that keto or all of this stuff could cure you by any means. I'm saying that I got hope. I had my hope reinstilled because I started to control what I can. And I think too, when people get frustrated, like, or in like feel like I've truly felt stuck in my body. Right. And I'm like, okay, but if I could never, ever, ever get out of this situation and I'm stuck the way that I am, what are things that I can control my nutrition, my movement, despite hurting my self-care, my sleep, and my hydration. Like those are five things that you can really handle and look at from a lifestyle perspective that you can control those things. I can't control my genetics. I can't control my disease. I need to get to a root cause of what's going on there, but it's not just like, oh, I'm going to do keto. It's going to solve everything. And the compound effect of all of your body processes being out of whack for 12 plus years is also a lot to unpack. It's not just as simple as take this or take this or eat this. You're going to be solved. It's a very hard, long road, but it doesn't have to be long and hard. If you focus on five things and actually enjoy the journey, because if I died tomorrow, I'd a hell of a life. And that's always the perspective I look at, you know, I love that. You know, what frustrates me is that I, so many people have told me that when they've gone into their doctor, their doctor says, Oh, well, you know, this is just genetic. You're just going to have to deal with it. You're just gonna have to live with it. It runs in your family, whatever, just take this drug, whatever. And that to me is horrifying because you may not be able to reverse something or can, can, you know, keep it from happening completely, mm -hmm. but you can always, always, always improve the situation always 100%. improve it in some way. And so mm -hmm. to be told that to me is horrifying. And one of the ones that gets me the most is uh, type two diabetes. Yeah. Uh, which yeah. we know, we know mm -hmm. that that is almost always reversible with mm -hmm. the proper lifestyle diet changes. Now there's, there's always going to be exceptions, but for yeah. most people, change your lifestyle. Guess what? I've seen it happen over and over and over a tons and tons of times, you know, by yeah. just making these simple changes that, yeah, it sucks. Okay. But it's doable. And to be told that just, uh, you're just going to have to take insulin or, you know, one of the drugs, whatever the rest of yeah. your life, there's nothing you can do. Ooh, 
that that just that that doesn't sit right with me because you know the message i think we should put out there is that even though you may not completely reverse something there's always hope there is hope that maybe you can make some improvements to make your life better quality of life is everything you don't have to accept that never accept yeah. that i refuse you tell me that I'm going to look at you and go, watch me. <laughs> you know, that's not okay. You're not going to tell me that I ha- I have no control over, over my health in any way. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I think that, no, and I fully agree with you. Like, I just want to high five you and hug you for sure. Um, but that is why we do what we do. Right. Like, but I just think from a doctor's perspective, that's how they've been taught in medical oh, yes. school, treat symptoms, but also mm-hmm. from a patient's perspective, that's what we've been taught. Listen to your doctor, do what your doctor says. So it's like this brainwashed trust and we lose sight of our personal power and how we forget like that doctor doesn't know stuff and that doctor might be having a bad day. You know, you mess up at your work. I could never be a doctor. Cause I'd be like, Oh God, I can't. Um, <laughs> but like, like, but you know what I mean? Like we all have bad days. We all have, you know, like you're doing the best that you can with the information and the, uh-huh. like everything that you have. But like, this is why you and I do what we do, because like, we have a responsibility to educate people that there are ways around it. Like there are things that you can control. And I mean, we're just getting started. Like, I think that as crazy as 2020 was, Uh um, you know, that was a huge wake up call. And I think people are starting to wake up to realize that like health and wellness needs to be a priority. We just live on this society of being asleep essentially and we just think okay well we're retold at a very young age listen to your doctor high fat's bad low fat's bad cholesterol like we're just taking all of the information that we've heard quotes but like does that actually make sense or believe like ring true for you and that was like the one thing that every time I left those doctors like yeah I would like emotionally eat drive to Chipotle have 17 burritos and 10 bags of chips chips because well, nothing works anyway. Like, you know, I had that, I did go into a victim mentality, developed poor relationships with food, completely lost trust in myself, but it's just going back to, Hey, you have the power, but until you recognize that you are kind of stuck in this trap and you need to find the key, you're never going to be able to get out. And it's not your fault. You're just set up. Uh, Yes. Uh, Yes, that's exactly it. But I will tell you, you know, being empowered, when you take back that responsibility for your own health, you know, I'm not responsible for anybody else. I am Mm. responsible for me, my Mm. health, what I put in my mouth, what, what I do in my lifestyle, I'm responsible for. And Mm. I think once people really fully understand that and accept that and actually do it, it feels good. It feels powerful. It feels like you, you have hope you can accomplish something. You, you can make something happen. Maybe not a hundred percent of what you want, but you know, that's life. Sometimes you, you, some things are, are out of your control, but if you can do something, why the heck wouldn't you want to do something? Quality of life is everything. It's everything. And I think people just, you know, they go about their lives and they're kind of drone on and they watch the TV. They're on their, you know, internet, on their phones, doing all their different stuff. And, and they're just letting everybody else do the work for them. And yeah, it hasn't worked out very well for us, (laughs) you know? Yeah. And that's why I say that being in your personal power is the most important thing. And we, I mean, we could go down a million rabbit holes, but like when you start to do a diet and you're like, okay, well, all right, I'm let's just paint the scenario if I can. So you wake up and you're like, okay, I feel gross. I am kind of overweight. I know I need to make changes. I should, should go to the gym, should do this. You should all over yourself. Then you're like, okay. And and then that's on a Wednesday, right? You're like, okay, but I'm going to start Monday but you wait from Wednesday to Monday to make changes because you're gearing up quotes to do this diet. And you have to take all of the energy that you have inside of you. All right, I'm going to start Monday. I'm going to start Monday. I'm doing this. Like, this is for real this time. Like I'm going to do it. And then you start Monday and you're, um, you're just high stress. Something happens. And then another excuse and another Monday you fall off. Right. And 
but doesn't that sound exhausting? Like all of the mental work, not only just like not even avoiding carbs and trying to get through the keto flu, but like, so that's the hard part, right? Like doing that. And then you beat yourself up because you're like, well, great. I guess there's something wrong with me. I hate this. Like, why can't I just have willpower instead of just dialing it back for one? Like, this is like the, the heavens are going to unicorns are going to come down from the heavens right now for y'all instead of doing that whole diet drama of like, I'm gonna, gonna, gonna take a deep breath. What will make me feel better right now? What, how can I make a different choice than I did yesterday? The next meal, if you have a cheat meal, okay, we don't need to do this whole diet drama of like, oh my God, what's wrong with me? I just had a cheat meal. F it. I'm just going to have like 17 more carbs. <laughs> um, no, how about, well, yeah, but like, why not just, okay. I had that. Forgive myself. I'm going to now eat a meat, a veggie and healthy fat. I'm going to eat it meat and a veggie, the healthy fat the next day. And then, okay, well maybe I'll have a burrito, but the next meal I'm going to have a meat, veggie, healthy fat. Like it's, we just create this whole drama or chaos in our brains because that is the conditioning and the program that we have. So there's nothing wrong with you. Uh, yes. You know, and the nothing whole wrong with you. Willpower. The willpower. This annoys me to no end. And I will say mm-hmm. why, because I have willpower that I will put up against anybody, anybody. I will take you yeah. on right now. I have that Same. kind of willpower. <laughs> it's crazy. So you can never come at me about willpower, but there comes a point where that's not what it's about. It's just not what it's about. You can't willpower your way into uh, permanent changes long term. Mm-hmm. That you know, what? Talk a little bit more about the the willpower thing because that's one that I'm just like, oh, yes, you have to have some, of course, to get started. Blah blah blah, whatever. But to rely on that, you can't. <laughs> you can't rely on it. Can I ask you a question? Sure. So your willpower, you said my willpower is unshakable. Like I got this, right? Do you think it's actually willpower? Do you think you just love yourself enough to actually do what you truly desire to do? To be honest, back then it was pure willpower, stubbornness. And Mm -hmm. when I set a goal, I will make that goal period. And it doesn't matter what I have to do to make that goal. It's going to happen. And it it did every single time. I, without mm. fail, I made my goals. And so no, at that point, no, now mm. you bet. No, I had a, a serious self-hatred, especially with my body. I liked myself, yeah, of course. but I hated my body. And so it was mm. my enemy. So yeah, I can't say I'm still working on the self-love part. I like mm. myself now. I can accept yeah. myself. I can look in the mirror and go, okay, maybe you're not perfect, but okay. It's all right. It's okay. Cause your body's doing the best it can with what you're giving it right now and what yeah. you've done to it. So it's this amazing thing. We're good. We're good. We're friends yeah. now. I'm not saying I love it, but we're friends. <laughs> I love it though. And that's, that's it. Like the reason why I was asking that is because like we rely on willpower and we rely on pushing through or relying on setting our goals you re because you went through what you went through and you did the thing you reconditioned, you got, you unlocked yourself out of the trap through your, by healing your own personal power. We rely on willpower because it's the circumstances that we're in at the moment, but it eventually evolves and personal power comes from reconditioning our trauma, healing our trauma and reconditioning our diet programming and reconditioning our, all those things. So you reconditioned the way that you used to think by relying on willpower and evolve to now still on a self-love journey, aren't we all? Um, yes. <laughs> but it doesn't matter what area of your life, we're all on a self-love journey at some point, but it's, you've evolved out of that. And you didn't choose to sit there and be like, I have no willpower, guess it sucks. I'm just gonna continue to eat like trash. You mm-hmm. went on the journey, which is not easy to have that hard conversation with yourself. Like, hey, I gotta do something. Okay, well, I'm just gonna set this goal, but like, the willpower and the lack or the perception of having lack of willpower is that whole, I'm going to start on Monday mantra. That's got to go. That's old conditioning. All of that stuff is driven from what sounds nice, what I know I need to be doing, but I'm not really sure how to execute that. It's a, it's two different conversations, waking up one day and be like, all right, I have willpower. I'm going to go to the gym seven days a week, but bro, you don't even have sneakers is a different conversation to, okay, well, I have willpower enough to go buy some sneakers and maybe sign up at the gym. It's two different, 
Do you see that? But we put all this oh, pressure yeah. on ourselves because it sounds nice. Well, XYZ person lost XYZ on XYZ diet. I'm going to do that diet. And oh my God, I just saw it on Good, Good Morning America. That it, okay, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. But you don't really even know what you're doing or you don't even know if you really want to do it. Exactly. So what feel what feels good to you? What is right for you? Not right according to whoever, you know, it's to you. Let me just tell you something. And I brought this up on another podcast before, because it was so incredibly disturbing to me on one of my posts. I was talking about body dysmorphia, which is something I struggled with and maybe to a degree still have a little bit of that going on a little bit of that. It's much better, but I can't complain, but it's still in the back of my mind. Right. Well, Mm -hmm. somebody commented, well, if they don't like the way they look, they can just get off their lazy butts and do something about it. And that's when I'm like, oh, dude, oh, you did not just really even go there because you do not know who you're talking to. You have no clue. (laughs) You know, Mm -hmm. you don't know the iron willpower I have. So you cannot sit there and say that. And in any way, body dysmorphia has nothing to do with really how you honestly look, because you can have the most perfect body according to everybody else in the world. But what you see in the mirror is something different. That is a mental thing. That is not about yeah. being lazy. And I hate that. That I hate that, you know, oh, you're just lazy. You have no willpower. Yeah. Uh, you know, mm. I hope, I hope that you gave that person a one-way ticket to the block party that you uh, Yes, I did. Um, yes, I did. <laughs> wow. After I tried talking to, to, so he would understand, I thought maybe he just didn't understand what it was. Yeah. Yeah. That just no, it still goes you. back. It still goes back to, you know, you know, not you're just choosing not to. No, you can have the most slamming body and like find something that you don't like about yourself. Like I'm, you know, my body composition definitely needs some work. I have major atrophy that I'm still trying to like rebuild or whatever, but like, so I don't have like the relation I've been up and down on weight, never been significantly overweight, but definitely 30 pounds I've had to lose. Um, but it had nothing to do with that. And everything to do with just like the way that I perceive myself, the way I'm showing up in the world, like my confidence has been shaken. I've been through so much, but again, it's just reconditioning. Like if you're going to tell stories, like tell good ones, um, you know, in your brain, you know, like, Hey, if you're picking your part yourself, you're are your own worst critic, but like, you have to start catching it and you can't, sometimes people don't even have the realization that they feel that way. That's right. Um, and it's until you develop that awareness, you're not going to be able to flip it. And I mean, Mm -hmm. I was just crying the other day about, I like heard myself, like I was crying about something. I don't know, I cry all the time. It just is who I am sometimes. Um, No, but like I was catching myself in this, like I caught myself saying like, oh, I don't feel good. Like I, like no one likes me. Like, I don't know. I was just like went into this whole thing in my own brain and yes, I'm seasoned in psychology. Yes, I'm seasoned in like all of this stuff I've been doing like coaching for five years, but it's just, I still get the self-doubt. I still get that. And it's the ability, developing the ability to catch it and reframe it is the work. It's not, Mm -hmm. you're going, you are, we are all thoughtaholics. Like we all, we all are one thought away from spiraling hundred percent. And it's until you catch that and don't allow it to become a spiral and recognize that it's just your ego trying to keep you safe in your old patterning that's all it is. It you're never going to really like, I mean, unless you're like, who's the most conceited celebrity ever, you know, I don't know, <laughs> but like, you're never going, you doesn't matter. Every level is a new devil. You can evolve out of it. You can lose all the weight. You can all feel all that way. But if you don't truly love yourself and at least love something in the mirror, it, that's the work. That's true. And, and, and the, you mentioned reframing. Okay. Mm-hmm. That has been a huge thing for me. And this is what I implement a lot in my coaching with my clients, mm-hmm. because it's really not even the food so much. Most of the people, by the time they come to me, they've done their research, they've done the work they know, but they can't deal with the other stuff. And that's what I end up helping with mainly. Yep. And this whole reframing, like if you look at your body in the mirror and you go, Oh, good God, I'm a fat pig. And I did that many, many, many times. I've looked at myself. Oh, you don't even deserve to live. You're so fat and ugly and you know, whatever. And mm-hmm. yes, I did. I said that to myself, but if you say that enough, you believe it. Yep. Even if somebody called you a fat pig enough, 
you believe it. And, you know, even a trauma from your past, Mm -hmm. like I was made fun of when I was very young, uh, well, 10 years old, when I started developing and somehow that translated into being fat, I don't really know, but um, it sounds so stupid to me now, but as a kid, I I didn't know. And so I believe that. I believe that. And so if you hear something enough, you believe it. And what do you think that happens when you say it to yourself? That is worse than if somebody else said it to you. It's worse. You know, and when you look in the mirror, you know, like I said, now I look in the mirror and go, "Eh, I look better. (laughs) You know, I'd like to be a few pounds less. Okay. But you know what? your body's doing the best it can right now. You just have a few issues going on. We'll work it out. It's okay. We got this, Yeah, (laughs) you know, and that's the way I talk to myself. Now I talk to myself, like we're in a partnership now, instead of this evil, horrible, nasty person that just didn't want to cooperate. Yeah. Yeah. It it makes a difference. It sounds kind of psycho, but it does make a difference how you talk to yourself. But I think that that is, our job as coaches to educate people that like, it's actually not normal to continually self-deprecate. It's not normal. It's it's okay to actually feel not okay, but also want to do something about it. Mm -hmm. You don't need to like always put your big girl pants on and like grit and grind through your day. Like you're allowed to feel your feelings. You're allowed to not like yourself at the moment, as long as you're willing to and open up yourself up to do the work and the healing in order to get to where you act truly, truly desire to go, but we forget that we actually have choice. We forget that we have the ability to create a life that we've always wanted, regardless of our circumstance. Um, but it's a lot easier to blame, shame, justify, and live in victims than be a victor. And being a victor takes a lot of reconditioning, reprogramming, everything. And yeah, but you got to enjoy the journey because you only get one life, one body. Well, and that's just it. And I think a lot of people think that when they're doing this, boom, they have to have this done right away, you know, in a, in a month or whatever it is, when it took, know. you know, 50 <laughs> years to get where you're at. And, and then they think there's an end date. I think there's a lot yep. of pressure relieved when you let go of that belief. And this is a never ending thing, but it's okay. That's not a bad mm-hmm. thing. It's okay. And we evolve and it's okay. Yep. Your body changes, circumstances changing, your environment changes, and you have to adapt to it. And that's okay. And it's, so it's never ending. So stop stressing about having to have everything done today. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's okay. Yeah. My, I have a mentor. She always says, um, evolution and growth over a lifetime. And when you evolve, you don't notice the evolution. You look back on it and you see the evolution, you know, it's not this instant gratification. Oh my God, I just lose 30 pounds. And then like, look at the biggest loser. Like all of those people mm-hmm. pretty much never keep the weight off. Intensity yep. tells a really cool story. Consistency develops results. And like, mm-hmm. you can be super intense for 30 days. And listen, I love our Facebook communities and social media and all of that. It's really awesome for connection and community and all of that. But it's also an Achilles heel because you go into comparison and comparitis is a very nasty right. disease. And I don't want it for anyone. <laughs> I so agree with that. And I've had the opportunity to talk to you uh, on the podcast, uh, women and men who have been mm-hmm. into like the body competitions you know, where oh, they yeah, yeah. slam in bodies, <laughs> you look, you like, dang, but they had a horrible relationship with their body and disordered eating mm-hmm. disordered thoughts. And yep, yep. they were anything but healthy mentally or physically, even though externally they had the body that you wished you could have. And so you compare yourself, but you have no idea what it cost them to look like. Yeah. I'm not saying there aren't some natural people out there goals. I'm pretty sure I've known some and disgusting, but it's true, (laughs) but those are unicorns. Those are unicorns. I mean, most of us cannot just be like that. It costs. And a lot of times it's mental and physical. Amen. Amen, girl. Amen. (laughs) Yeah. It's pretty sad. I mean, I had no idea. I mean, I knew to, you know, there's, there was some stuff going on there, but it's a lot more prominent than what you think in that world. So that, that really kind of opened my eyes and made me go, Ooh, okay. (laughs) Maybe Mm. next time I look at somebody and judge them as, Oh my God, you're so perfect. And I'm not, maybe I need to step back and go, is that really what I'd want for myself? 
yeah, you'd look good yeah. and all that and take nice pictures and wear a bikini and all that. But does that really help with your quality of life? You know, yeah, your, know. your long-term yeah. quality of life, because you're not going to be able to keep doing that when you're 80, it, it, especially if you start young, it, you, it, it's, it's hard, hard to maintain that. So, you know, giving up that whole idea of perfection and comparison of the social media, you know, you yeah. see out there and you're like, Oh, I want to look like that. If I just do what they're doing, then I'm going to look like that. Yeah. It doesn't really work that way. I love the analogy of just like the duck on the duck gliding on the pond, right? You're like, you see that and it's like, Oh, cool. But you don't see the underneath of like, what's actually kicking. And this isn't anything in life, not just like diets and exercise. It's like, you see people being super successful and you look at that and you're like, oh, well, what's wrong with me? Like, why can't I do it? But that you can do it. The only difference between that person and you is consistency and effort. Like that's it. There's nothing unless you're like a freaking genius, but like or whatever, <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, that's an, that's genetic and a circumstance that like you create your luck. You don't really, you know, some people can get lucky, but it really fundamentally comes down to consistency and really just keeping going like there's no real thing called failure unless you don't learn anything but when do you ever not learn anything exactly and you know what i've learned a lot more from my failures than i have my successes oh my <laughs> yeah. god i know <laughs> it's kind of one of those things where you know what it, it, that's life that is just yeah. something that's going to happen and it's okay it's okay to learn mm -hmm. from it. And like you kind of talked about earlier about when, when you do mess up, you're, you're not on your plan, whatever you want to call it. You don't just beat yourself up. You just kind of step back and go, mm, you know what? That probably wasn't my best decision I made. And I kind of feel like crap, but number one, why did I do what I did? What was going on? What needs were not yeah. being met? And okay. What can I do better next time? Is mm -hmm. there a pattern? do I do this kind of thing every time I'm mad at my spouse or whatever? I mean, <laughs> yeah. what is it? Well, when I get on social media and I see all these perfect people, does that make me go want to, you know, exercise until I drop dead, which whatever it is, does yep. it trigger? Yep. So figure out your pattern and all that. So I think, I think it's so important to really pay attention and to learn, learn from, you know, what goes wrong. And we're yeah. all going to make mistakes. We all do. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Just don't live in the mistake. Don't, don't continue down the rabbit hole, figure it out, stop yourself and say, why, what's going on? Or at yeah. least that, that's what I try to live by now. You know, it's like, I no longer just beat myself up. I, I, I mean, it's not like I cheat and stuff like that. I is, uh, but I do still do dumb stuff. And, and, you know, I have to stop myself and go, why did I, or why did I want to do that? Or why was I thinking about doing that? Or why yeah. did I just tell myself I look like a fat pig in this outfit? You know, those kind of things. Okay, stop it. Why? <laughs> you know, so I think there's always something to, to be learned by that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about what can somebody do if they find that they are emotional eaters, which let's face it, probably most of us are. What? What are some mm -hmm. steps? What do you tell your clients? How do they deal with that? Uh, well, I teach a whole course on this actually called food and feelings. Um, yes. but the frameworks really are your thoughts become emotions, your emotions become actions and actions create your reality. So you have to get a handle on your thoughts and our thoughts. We have 90,000. I forget what Dr. Jada Spenza said, or the research, it was like, 90,000 of the same thoughts over and over again. Well, no wonder your reality is the exactly the same because you're creating an emotion in your, your body. And then that emotion creates an action. And then that action becomes your reality. So if you're doing that over and over and over again, that's obviously going to create your situation that you're in. So in order to do that, we have to start ask, start creating different thoughts. And in order to do that, we have to start catching our thoughts and gently observing our thoughts and our patterns and our behaviors in order to make them make changes without the expectation of expecting to change them overnight. And then also too, without judgment. So we kind of have to, this is going to sound a little schizophrenic, but bear with me. So you have to kind of elevate and observe the way that you're behaving as you're behaving. <laughs> um, it sounds a little weird, but like, you know, just like you're catching your own negative thoughts and then be able to reframe them. You have to have that awareness. So 
we live so much on autopilot. We just wake up in the morning, it's 6 a.m. And then all of a sudden we're face first into the refrigerator because we have not regulated our thoughts at all. And then you repeat these same behaviors over and over again. In addition, you are stressed out and emotionally eating because you are stressed out. You are having a biological response to the stress emotion, which triggers cravings, et cetera. And then most of us are also nutritionally deficient. So those cravings are actually coming from your stress, your emotions, as well as, you know, pattern, patterns and behaviors. So it really fundamentally comes down to setting yourself up for success during the day, managing your emotions throughout the at night, having tough, difficult conversations with your partner or setting boundaries or whatever's going on in your world. And then having a really good night routine. Like that is like the framework to actual success in whatever diet you choose to do. Because if you're not willing to do the diet or you're constantly self-sabotaging, you're never going to see the results because you're going to repeat the same patterns over and over again. But most people are not understanding that one and two, let's just throw in not only your current behaviors, but let's just throw in our programming since we've been young, right? The baby's crying, have some Cheerios. Uh Oh, you broke up with your boyfriend. Here's Ben and Jerry's. Yeah. It's just the way that we are, or be quiet, stuff your feelings. I'll give you some ice cream. So we have not as a society even been set up for success on how to regulate our emotions and how to really manage that. So if you're finding that you're face first into the fridge at 5 PM, most people who have recognize that this is the pattern of behavior. Don't even understand that why that's happening. It's because it starts with the first wake up in the morning. And well, when you come out of the womb as well, you're yeah. programming, but like exploring your patterns, behaviors, thoughts, traumas, etc. how were food and things viewed in your home? You know, what did your parents teach you when you were younger as well. And really unpacking that and looking at that. But fundamentally, if you had to start today to really start ending emotional eating and managing it, start looking at your, the way that you're waking up. Are you proactively responding to your life or are you, are you proactively responding to your life or are you reactionary in your life? And if you are in a reaction mode, reaction mode, reaction mode, that's causing stress, hormones, crazy thoughts and everything. You're perpetuating those behaviors. So you need to go from a place of reactionary to proactive. And it actually starts with stop sleeping with your phone because you wake up in the morning, check social media or Susie from accounting's pissing you off already at six 30 in the morning. You have not even had your coffee yet and you're just triggered, right? So more specifically, let's just use this as an example. You get a text message from your boss. Hey, we need to talk. What happens? Your palms get sweaty. Your heart races. You're thinking the worst. Imagine like those little things, micro stressors all day long impacting you. That's happening over and over and over again in Mm -hmm. your body. So it's causing chemical responses as well as emotions. And you're not able to regulate that. So it has to start with paying attention and regulating and being mindful. So setting a really, really good morning routine. And I hate the word routine because it sounds exhausting, but a ritual my rituals change every day, depending if I'm late for the gym, which I'm 90% of the time late for the gym. Um, but deep breathing, like putting your hand on your chest and your heart is beating, feel your heart beating and be grateful that you have are alive and safe and in a home and have the ability to eat. And, you know, you have all of these things that we kind of forget to give gratitude for because we want to be X, Y, Z further along when, if we would just, remain present and be like, Hey, I'm safe. I'm alive. Everything after that is a choice. I love that. And, and it's kind of funny that you you kind of bring that last part up because, um, I, I know that I need some work in that area. I recognize that. I understand this about me. I am very high stress. I'm very, um, go, 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 go. I can't stop, you know, uh, 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 you know, laying around. I didn't know. I can't do that. I always have to be doing something. I can't even sit down and watch TV if I wanted to <laughs> relax because I have to be doing 10 other things at the same time. So I, yep. I get that. So I just ordered me one of those, um, mindfulness journals, if you will. Mm-hmm. I mean, and I like pretty, I like 
you know, neat stuff. So I got this really pretty book and I got some pretty pens and I'm going to kind of write down like the night before what some key points that I want to do the next day. So I have a plan. It's in my head. And I think about that and also work on some of the, you know, like you, you talk about gratitude, you know, what, what are some good things that happened? You know, like, mm-hmm. what can I focus on instead? What, what can I do different? You know, those kind of things as well, you know, just having it all in one place and putting it on paper, I think is real powerful. And, you know, I tell my clients to do that all the time. And I'm like, I need to practice what a preach yes. <laughs> my friend is stressed. You know, I got way too much going on and not, not really sure how to balance it all, you know? So I, I need to be more focused on in that too. I mean, I have work to do too. We all do. Yeah. And, and that's okay. It's okay. You know, do what you got to do and that uh, that's okay. And so I, I love your approach. I think that's real similar to what I do. So I love mm-hmm. that. And, um, one thing I want to kind of bring up, and I tend to talk about this a lot, but I think it's so important. You even mentioned it, trauma, past trauma. And like I yep. said, the past trauma that happened to me, even though to somebody else, it's like, oh, get over it. It was trauma to me. And nobody else gets to decide what's trauma for me. Only I do. And I know how it affected me. Now I had to do a lot of work and that's hard. And I think a lot of people don't want to do that work because it's hard and it's ugly. It's ugly. You don't want to go back there, but sometimes you have to. And even though you may not really think of it as a trauma, maybe it was. So how do you incorporate that? Because that is a big part. I mean, obviously you're not going to do the the therapy or whatever, but, yeah. you know, to bring awareness of, of a situation when you kind of recognize it, I can pretty much recognize it right off the bat with a client and kind of get a feeling that mm, there's a little bit deeper than this. And, you know, even though I'm not qualified to, you know, deal with certain issues, it's, it's there. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I mean, the spectrum of trauma doesn't necessarily need to be like what we think is trauma is like a car accident or a sexual assault or something like that. It's like a lot of my protectiveness and my, um, need or inability to ask for help comes from a moment where I actually was pushed over by a child in the doctor's office when I was two years old and I fell and hit my head and like bled everywhere. And it was a very trip. I don't have any idea, but like I was building something and somebody came and knocked it down and then I bled. So like, that's my trauma. Like that's where I know a lot of my stuff is, but I spent all these years like blaming my mommy and daddy issues. So I just have gotten to the root of that through a ton of therapy and like different modalities, but like, that's kind of where it comes up. Um, but you don't have the awareness that that is happening until you start noticing like self-sabotaging behavior. So my self-sabotaging behavior was like, I don't ask for help. I, I got it. I got, I got it. I don't trust my team. Like there's just a lot of things that like are actually causing me more exhaustion and actually not (laughs) moving me forward versus looking at it and be like, okay, what's here. Right. And there's nothing wrong with me. Things happened to me for me. (laughs) Like, you know what I mean? And, uh, and look, yes, of course our parents are, you know, we all have mommy and daddy issues at some varying degree. (laughs) Right. Um, but it's like, having the ability to recognize, okay, this behavior is no longer serving me. Where is it coming from? But I actually personally will not work with anyone who's not really willing to have that like ability to want to unpack it. Right. Cause you're right. Mm-hmm. Like people don't want to unpack it, but I also think that you have to have the awareness that your food choices and your lifestyle choices and your overall choices in general and your life is based on all of that. And if you don't make the connection, because we live in this society where we're just supposed Mm -hmm. to put our big girl pants on and keep going and stop crying and minimize and minimize and minimize. But if we're minimizing, 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 of course, your hardwired computer is going to start acting weird and it needs a reboot. And in order to be able to reboot that, you have to start looking at where the programming and processes that are no longer, or that are like need to be reprogrammed. And I just don't think you're either ready or you're not. And God, angels, universe, whatever you guys believe will put it in front of your face a million times until you finally are able to That's recognize right. it and mm-hmm. you're getting your spiritual assignments. And if you keep avoiding the spiritual assignment, the spiritual assignment's going to keep coming up. But until you're ready to be like, okay, this is the behavior. 
And people don't know, well, why don't I have willpower? Why can't I stick to the keto diet for more than five days? Okay, well, how was be, like ask powerful questions to get different answers, right? Well, is it really about willpower or what's going on in your life? Like how was food viewed in your home? You know, you, you listen to the, listen or read the verbiage of what they're saying. And then kind of, because we're good coaches, read a little bit more between the lines to ask the question to see if they are ready. Um, and if they're not really ready to do that, you kind of have to hold space for them and just tell them that like the thing that you're resisting is probably the thing that you need to step through. That will free you will free you because you cannot have long-term success until you deal with those things that keep coming up. Like you said, over and over and over again. And like I said, Mm. I was able to accomplish every goal I made. That was not the problem, but I couldn't maintain it Mm. any, anything because I never dealt with really the underlying issue. And that Mm. took a lot of work and it, and it hurt and it was ugly, but it was crucial to my growth. And I mean, there's still stuff I need to deal with. I mean, we're not ever (laughs) just done. We're just not. And that's okay. That's okay. We're human. It's okay. And I think it's also okay to ask for help, whether it's from a therapist, whether it's from a coach like us, it's okay. It's okay Mm. to do that. And there's nothing wrong with asking for help because you know what? It's freaking hard to unpack. Mm. It is. And until you go through it. Yeah. I think asking for help is actually the bravest thing that you can do. And that's actually pretty selfish because like, this is just what I've experienced. Um, and in order, like we're in survival mode and we have been trained since we were babies to be in survival mode, stop crying, minimize your feelings. Kids are meant to be seen, not heard, et cetera. Like you're just set up. And then our society is like, well, go get them. And then it's like, we just are not again, set up for success. And until you really realize that you have the key to escape, you're not really able to do it until you're ready to have that, like unlock it, you know, like that's right. You have to, you have to just gently observe like what's going on and you know, it's not fun and shadow, like you have to explore the shadows in order to get to the light. And that's just how it is. And if you look back on your entire life though, up until right today, doesn't everything make sense? Like you wouldn't really, it does to me. Mm-hmm. You would not change really anything, right? Because you have the life that you have now. And I think that we just get lost in the thick of all the things that are happening that we think are to us, but we're not. If you look back right. and you're like, okay, just take a pause. How can I explore this or see this differently? Or what is really the root of what is going on? That's the work, but a lot of people are just fine not doing it. And that's okay too. But it's not our jobs to convince yeah. them that they need trauma no. healing. <laughs> yeah. And it's, oh, it's so incredibly <laughs> true. And I know so many people. And it, it's heartbreaking to me because I see it. But um, I don't know if you're this way too, but, you know, I, I don't like to get too hokey, whatever. But um, I'm pretty sure I'm an empath to a degree. I'm not saying I'm one of those yeah. super, super ones, but I deeply feel like I feel when I'm around somebody, I can, de- I can already tell you yep. there's something not right. There's something wrong. I'm not talking no danger, danger. I'm talking, I feel a sadness. I feel a, a like something's not right. And especially yeah. talking to a client, even on like this through, through a computer, I feel it, I see it, mm-hmm. you know? Yep. And so it just makes me wonder, you know, like everything that we've gone through, <laughs> you know, it's like, it, it, I can't help but think it, it kind of tunes you in. And that's what we were meant to do is, you know, yeah. share our stories because, you know, other people are going through the exact same thing. I, I'm not a unicorn. I'm not anybody special. This is something that, you know, is common. And, and so many people yep. just, they don't see this and, and it's sad because they think they're broken. They think they're, you know, or not worthy. Oh, that really breaks my heart. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when somebody doesn't feel like they're worth enough to put in the effort. Yeah. I see that a lot. I see that a lot. And it's like, yeah. uh, yeah, that's, that's some very false, you know, belief right there because you are, you know, no matter who you are, you are worth having a good quality of life mentally, physically, spiritually, you know, I agree. Yep. You are worthy because you are here. Like I forget the statistic on that too. It's like one in 1 billion or something for you to actually become a human. Like the statistical chance of you actually becoming who you are is like 
one in one billion or something like isn't that enough to be like holy crap like yeah like it's you know you are a miracle just because you are here you know and then you're a miracle because you survived your childhood you're a miracle because you have (laughs) survived your adolescence and high school and whatever (laughs) awkward stage and you know I think that we just live in lack a lot of the times just because that's just we desire so much for our life but we wish that we want more but like we're actually able to create that if we're willing to do the work and exploration around it and switch from survive mode to thrive mode like what will actually make you thrive versus like okay well I'm just doing this Mm -hmm. to survive the huge difference there is a huge difference because once you have that freedom that like where you kind of break loose of a lot of this, um, food freedom too. I mean, there, that's all part of it because that was kind of my, you know, how I (laughs) got into everything, whatever, but it's freeing, it's freeing. It feels like you're living in this shades of gray world. And then all of a sudden now you have color woo, and it's like, it just feels good. And you know, yeah, you know, part of me is sad that, you know, I had to go through what I did, that if I just had the knowledge I had now back then, I could have saved myself so much, you know, whatever. But then I think, then I wouldn't be the person I am now. Right. Then I wouldn't be able to have empathy for those who are going through the same thing as me. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't, you know, from a young age, I always knew I I was one of these people who wanted to help other people. Um, And so it was kind of like one of these things. And so I think the growth I, I look back now and I don't get angry about it anymore, you know, and yeah. every once in a while I will get sad. Like something will trigger me and I'll, I'll just all of a sudden cry. And I'm like, Ooh, wow. Where did that come from? Okay. I still have some work to do, but for the most yeah. part, I look back and I'm like, I can show my pictures. I can talk about things that happen now and I'm okay with that, you know? And I, yeah. I, I think Every, people need to know that. And that's okay. And that's part of growth. And it, it, it does affect your health, hundred percent affect your health. So in case anybody's wondering why we're on this subject, it does go back to your health. It goes back to emotional eating. It goes back to, it affects everything, you know, physically, yeah. mentally, everything. And just because we've mastered kind of the food portion of this doesn't mean that we're not messy in other areas. You know what I oh, mean? Yeah. Like <laughs> I use my business all the time. Like I, literally teach the same principles in food and feelings as I do that I'm getting coached on in my business, like the self-sabotaging behavior. Like, where's this coming from? Like all of this stuff, just the same kind of application. Well, where's your mindset? How's your morning routine? Are you practicing self-care? How's your diet? Like all of that stuff. Well, diet's good, but like, you know what I mean? Like all of these (laughs) principles are just life principles. It's just applicable in every single thing. If you recognize a self-sabotaging behavior in our instances, the people that we coach are just not either going after their health and wellness goals. Okay. But why? Right. Because all the meal plans and the pills and the potions and all of that will never work until you have made an empowered decision to actually want to do it. Now you don't need to be perfect. You can have a burrito here and there. Not, not the end of the world. Like you're not a failure because you enjoyed a burrito. They're freaking delicious, but (laughs) it's this stress about needing perfection, but it comes from our programming from such a young age, as well as the society, as well as the food industry, as well as the diet industry, as well as yeah. like social media, like you have so many contributing factors that really impact. And it's, you know, it all impacts everywhere. It does. It really does. Okay. We are coming up on time. Let me just make sure I didn't <laughs> Let me go back over uh, the five pillars of health. You have mentioned it, but could you just go over it point by point? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, for sure. So focus on your nutrition. The only diet will work. It was the one you're willing to do for a long period of time consistently every single day. Um, so create something that works for you. I obviously love low carb keto. Cause I think that that's just how our, our bodies are just genetically designed to eat that way. We're not designed to eat the high impact load of sugar and all of that, but carbs are, you know, listen, they're not, don't fear them forever. You know, if you want a peach, cause it's summertime and it's peach season. I don't know. That's how it is in South Carolina right now. Eat a freaking peach. No one got fat from pe- peaches, you know? So nutrition, self-care, which that should probably be flipped like self-care, but I'm not talking about just bubble baths and nail polish. I'm talking about mm-hmm. setting boundaries, healing your trauma, managing your stress, managing your emotions, managing your thoughts, managing your routine. That's all self-care. Um, so self-care, nutrition, hydration, 
drink some freaking water, uh, you know, uh, get good sleep and move your body. So those are super awesome. important things. Yep, yep. I got a question for you that this, this is something that just came out the other day and, yep. um, oh, I'm just so mm, torn on this one. Okay. Ooh, you're going to be nervous, love, but I love a good, I love a good <laughs> trigger question. I love okay, it. See, see if you know any of this information. I haven't had the opportunity to dig into it just yet. Um, mm-hmm. but sparkling water. Okay. I'm not talking about the stuff with natural, whatever I'm talking, just normal, straight sparkling water. Now I know some of it has, what is it? The PFAs or whatever. Okay. L- let's just not even talk about that part of it. Okay. Just the carbonation period that's in sparkling mineral water, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, I have been testing low for magnesium, but my cortisol is also high. Cause I know I'm very high, high stress. And I'm where I'm working on this. I'm still trying to, but my cortisol is high. So, and I know that zaps your, your magnesium. However, my husband came across something the other day that, um, carbonated water, and it didn't break down if it's sparkling water can zap mm-hmm. your magnesium. And since you brought up the hydration thing, have you heard anything about that? I will do some more research on that, but I'm talking just normal, straight, sparkling water with nothing else in it. Yeah. The, okay. So the way that I understood it and I, now you're making me like, want to go research this or do a Facebook live on it or something. Um, no, because this is the first time I've actually heard that. And I fundamentally teach everyone just drink high quality H2O because it's a molecular compound. Mm-hmm. Um, I did read loosely one time that same thing, like magnesium, you know, deplete your body of magnesium because it's not a full on H2O molecule. So your body's going to take it on and process it differently. So I was, I'm drinking a bubbly right now, like no big deal, you know, and, and, you know, but I've also drank two liters of water as well. So I think like they're good sippy drinks or whatever, you know, if you really feel called to do that, but like, if you're drinking them to replace a diet Coke habit or some sort of other thing. Right. Okay. Then move that in that direction, but also just remember drinking high quality H2O, like the water boy, <laughs> um, is super important. Um, just to make sure that you're getting your natural hydration and it takes like, people just think, Oh, I need to drink a gallon of water and it absorbs in your body quickly. Um, it takes a little while to actually have that absorb in your body as well. So just drink high quality H2O. And then if you want, in addition to whatever you want to sip on throughout the day or whatever, then go ahead and get on with your bad self, but make sure that you're drinking high quality H2O just from a detox perspective, from a molecular perspective, you know, you just want to have that quality hydration. So, yeah. And you know, I am so all over the place with, with the whole hydration thing. I mean, obviously it is important to a degree, but I also think what we've been told, like you said, you know, drink a gallon of water, uh, uh, you need all this. Uh, they, they pulled that out of their butt. I mean, pretty much they're, everybody's a little bit different. Um, yeah. and you know, I've done testing, I don't know if you've heard of vessel, but they have like the pea strips that have like mm-hmm. magnesium, cortisol, um, uh, hydration and a couple of other things it is the coolest thing. Super cool. But you just dip it in your pee, your morning pee. And then it just kind of yeah. gives you a range. It's really cool. Anyway, my magnesium is, is in the low range. My cortisol high range hydration is dead on perfect. So, you know, I kind of get some readouts like that, right? Yeah. But then I'm hearing it. My husband comes in and he's like, oh my God, you know, all that sparkling mineral water you drink it might be zapping your magnesium. And I'm like, what? Don't even tell me that it's like, oh, that's the one thing I love. You know, it's like, oh, please. So I plan on doing some research on that, but I just thought that was kind of an interesting thing since you brought up the whole hydration thing. Um, yeah. I, you know, if it's zapping magnesium now, you know, of course I know my cortisol is high, so it zaps my magnesium. That's a thing in, in carbonation. When you're talking about a Coke, you have all that sugar and for every, what is it? Every, uh, gram of sugar, it takes 27 grams of magnesium to process. I believe that's right. Um, mm. So obviously that would be an issue that makes complete sense, but the carbonation itself, that's my question. So I want to find out more about that mm-hmm. as far in relation to, you know, and th- then I, my husband also read that carbonation water can actually be more hydrating than your regular water. So it's one of those things. So I plan on doing I, some more research, but 
I don't know. Yeah, I think it's one of those things that's like seek and you shall find, right? Like we can all find a million <laughs> yeah. studies on that and we can all, you know, and it, this again goes back to what makes sense and feels good for you. True. And, you know, if it is a concern for you and you are low on magnesium, try it out and see yeah, if it helps. Yeah, I may have to try and see. You know, we, yeah. we collect data and facts and then we get into an analysis paralysis versus like, hey, like, hey, okay, well, I'm a little low on magnesium and I got a lot of other things going on, but I'm just going to bump up my water a little bit and dial it, <laughs> dial it back and see what happens. Like, but somebody could hear that information and be like, I'm never drinking sparkling water again. And right, right, right. Go right. to that level of extreme because one mm-hmm. random study comes out. Well, also too, where did the study come from? Who funded the study? What, yeah, you know, oh yeah. what's that being published? Like, we can go down a million rabbit holes. Girl, oh, so, yeah. <laughs> I'm saying, I'm saying, yeah. And, and you, you know, confirmation bias. I mean, if, if you're wanting to prove something, you, you're going to be able to, <laughs> you know, yeah. you're going to find something that will support what you're saying. And so yeah. it is very difficult and yeah, you know, it may just be one of those experimenting things and, you know, <laughs> hope for the best until yeah. you find out something for real or not. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's also very interesting, but gosh, dang it. No, you know, I'm on, yeah. I gave up coffee. I, you know, gave up everything else, but my sparkling water really. So I'm hoping that's not the case, but we'll see. <laughs> I would, uh, my only suggestion with that, if you drink like whatever non infused, whatever, but it's straight like mineral water, maybe pop a couple, um, pink sea salt rocks in there that could help. That's the only thing I could suggest. So heard too. And this was interesting. I had one of my clients tell me that uh, drinking regular water set heavy in her stomach and kind of made her nauseous. And I was like, "Mm, I've never heard that. But then I had somebody on my podcast that hasn't been released yet where they talk Mm. about that, that that actually is a thing. And it has to do with the... Maybe I'm wrong, surface tension or something. And then by putting in salt, or there was something else you could put in that kind of like took care of that problem, we wouldn't have it anymore. But when I do drink regular water after paying attention, it does sit heavy with me. But our water is awful. It is just chock full of minerals and uh, like, like hard water. It's very hard water yeah, yeah, and, we, yeah. and we don't have a filter. So yeah. that's something that I definitely want to do, but um, it just doesn't sit right with me anymore. But you know, then again, I could be just so into the sparkling water. I don't even know anymore. So. <laughs> hey, it's now you have an exploration adventure that you get to go. On there you go. Back, so. Why not? Why not? Uh, <laughs> speaking of which, have you ever tried to see GM? Why am I blanking? I don't, maybe a continuous know. glucose yeah. monitor. Oh, I was like, wait, what? Yeah. What, what, what is that? Um, <laughs> what? Uh, no, um, no, I have not. Okay. Interesting. Okay. I have done it twice and I'm about to do it a third time. And one of the things that I'm going to try to do, and this is killing my spirit, this is killing me. But I used to, when I thought I was eating healthy, I used to eat like oatmeal at uh, the, the sugar-free version, the oatmeal. Um, and I would use it with skim milk and I would have a banana, banana and I would have okay. like raspberries, blueberries, and, um, blackberries when the blackberries were in season, I could get the other two all year, sometimes strawberries and also a piece of toast that that was, you see all the time. It, it's the, what is it? The whole grain, low fat, uh, low cal bread. Okay. You know oh talking God. About? With yes. mar- margarine okay? girl. <laughs> every day. And I thought I was eating good. And then for lunch, <laughs> I'm dying a little inside. Um, I would have the same piece of toast, you know, it, it, it's pretty small, you know, there's, there's small yeah. pieces and I would mix honey and peanut butter. That was my lunch every day Mm. for years. And my breakfast was the oatmeal for years because I thought it was healthy. Yeah. I figured that out. I can't remember what the, what, you know, looking up the, what it turns into sugar, you know, the carbs related to whatever, how much was in there. And I was like, Oh my good gosh. Anyway, my whole point was that is an experiment that I'm trying to work my way to, to doing it, it, it's killing my spirit, but I think it's important for people to understand because people have been told this is healthy and maybe for some people they can handle it. Okay. Maybe it's okay. But I saw what a banana did to me. I saw what honey did to me. Let's see what happens when they're all together. <laughs> you know, that. I want to show, well, I want to show. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, no, like what, what my normal meal looks like. I mean, my normal day looks like, which is pretty, you know, like this across the board, super, mm-hmm. you know, very little fluctuation. Now, when I had honey by itself, it said, shoom, boom. So I had a huge spike and a major crash. Uh, I was yeah. dizzy, sick, nauseated. It was, it was terrible. It's something I didn't want to ever do again. And then the banana didn't go up as high and, and it came down, you know, fairly a little bit slower, but it wasn't as big of a spike. But, you know, people need to see how that reacts with some people. I'm not saying everybody's going to have the same reaction as me, but just flat off the bat calling it healthy. I know. Maybe it's not, (laughs) you know? Yeah. And so, yeah, I may take one for the team and do that, even though hmm, I know I'm going to. Oh, girl, I want to know how it goes. So. We'll definitely have to stay connected and talk. I yeah, definitely want to talk for about sure. It, but it's, I'll, I'll do like, a post. I will. <laughs> yeah. Good. This is yeah, pretty no, scary, I, but. I know. And yeah. I think that just, that that's the misconception of what healthy is and like who funds these studies. And then like, we have the marketing label, the keto bread and the proteins that are premier and <laughs> um, yeah. certain things that like people will go into crazy arguments in the groups about, it's like, well, I lost a whole bunch of weight drinking these things. And it's like, yeah, well, okay. I can lose a whole bunch of weight on the gummy bear diet as long as I'm in a calorie deficit, but like, I'm going to trash my metabolism, but good on you for how it good on you for losing it. I mean, (laughs) like, but that's not, but that's like one, that's how zealot people are. And then two don't really understand that quality of food matters it's not just like fearing carbs or fearing you know read your freaking ingredients <laughs> absolutely and, and and i think that's the big thing too and and it's not like i don't believe that absolutely nobody should ever have carbs so whatever you know but mm-hmm. i do believe there are certain foods that you should steer clear of eat whole mm-hmm. natural foods okay yeah and also understand even like there's this big controversy about fruit okay well we also have to understand that fruit is bred differently now it is bred to be bigger um sweeter it is not the same as what we used to have and it's available all season long so you have to take that into consideration i mean i'm not saying it's it's just oh it's just bad across the board but generally speaking that is not something we were meant to eat all day long every day for the rest of our lives. That's not mm-hmm. how it was. That's not how we're designed. And some people yeah. may be able to get away with that more, but I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not one of them. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. there are probably more like me than not. And so yep. it's something that, you know, people need to be, you know, aware of not saying it's bad, not saying you can never have it, but use some common sense, you know, of, of and, and eat just, just eat whole real foods, please. <laughs> you know? that's the biggest yep. takeaway for me and however you decide to do that okay but yep. you know anyway Amen. well let's see well mandy it has been a blast talking with you i know we kind of went over our time i was just looking at that <laughs> but uh that's okay we had fun and I, I appreciate you coming on and discussing chronic illness and uh health related everything pretty much and mental too that we yeah. got a lot of good stuff in with that so thank you so well, much for coming on. Th- thanks for having me. I appreciate you. Absolutely. Bye, Mandy.